When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. This week, how does the brain work? I have no idea, and I'm finally okay with that. But first, I'm Quinn Emmett, and this is Important Not Important, science for people who give a shit. Now for today's big question. How does the brain actually work? Look, if we want to unfuck the future, right, we've clearly got a lot to figure out. But there is really great news. We've already invented most of what we need to build. Also good news which is kind of different, there are some things we do still need to invent, or at least improve on, or at least understand better, or at all. I've shared recently more of the madness behind how I think about how to think about what's next. And one way I categorize fundamental pieces of the future is like this. Number one, what we can't imagine yet. Number two, what we already imagined, but don't have any idea how to build. Number three, what we already imagined and were building, but it's technically incredibly difficult and maybe unsafe for whatever reasons. Number four, what we already imagined, already know how to build, but aren't building or building enough of because it's too expensive or because of political holdups, which can be broadly or regionally applicable. And last, what we already imagined, already know how to build, and are currently building. This is the funnel uh, through which most ideas and technologies pass, from soap to clean steel to both fission and fusion, cell-cultured meats to mRNA vaccines, solid-state batteries to GPTs, immunological treatments, and CRISPR. Most of it fails. Innovations happen much differently than we think. We just gotta keep at it, together. So there's an essential role to play at every stage, starting from basic science research, for example, radioactivity or DNA, to drastically more specific applications for known problems, vaccines, bed nets, solar panels, and wastewater epidemiology. Of course, we don't get the latter without heavily investing in the former, however less sexy or more profitable basic science may be. Similarly, research funding varies dramatically across disciplines, usually depending on the addressable market, from cardiovascular drugs to obesity drugs to more rare genetic diseases or kids' cancer. The way we actually go about allocating funding, an endless, distracting grant-making process, is the subject of another conversation, but we'll touch on it below. And so are the human-centered problems and roadblocks, which we discussed a couple weeks ago. For example, yes, self-driving cars are still really, really difficult to get right and relatively dangerous, um, however much progress we've made. Meanwhile, human driving cars are a fucking nightmare to everyone for myriad reasons that are much more difficult to solve for because they're about us. Anyways, imagine for a moment we have all the money and underlying research technology we need, the best minds thrown at a problem, a necessary problem, one in need of answers right now. Imagine that with all of this, we still can't crack it. And not only can we not crack it, but the best minds seem to agree, broadly, that the more we do find out, the more we're made aware of how much we don't know, and further, what we don't know about what we don't know. This is the brain, basically. I'm not even talking about brain cancer or CTE-specific conditions. I'm talking about the absolutely insane efforts required just to understand how it works on a day-to-day -day and minute-to-minute -minute basis, full stop. You're probably thinking, surely a supercomputer could help us plumb the depths of gray matter. Well, here's an example from just this week, courtesy of the Wall Street Journal, of such a device. Here's the quote. 
Inside a vast data center on the outskirts of Chicago, the most powerful supercomputer in the world is coming to life. The machine will be able to analyze connections inside the brain and help design batteries that charge faster and longer. Called Aurora, the supercomputer's high-performance capabilities will be matched with the latest advances in artificial intelligence. Together, they will be used by scientists researching cancer, nuclear fusion, vaccines, climate change, encryption, cosmology, and other complex sciences and technologies. Aurora is the size of two tennis courts, weighs 600 tons, and is expected to be the world's first supercomputer capable of two quintillion operations a second at peak performance, scientists at Oregon said. Okay, so that sets the stage for how crazy this thing is. World's fastest supercomputer. Let's do it. Okay, here's the next part of the article that we need to pay attention to. Researchers recently used Aurora to screen 22 billion drug molecules an hour accelerating potential drug discovery. So 22 billion drug molecules an hour. Okay, ready for the catch? Next quote. Another potential task is mapping connections in the brain, a task so complicated it could take Aurora a full day to process a tiny sliver of the brain. So 22 uh, billion drug molecules an hour, but a full day to process a tiny sliver of the brain. Yeah, it can improve climate change forecasts and maybe also operate its own robots, which pros and cons there, but let's come back to the brain. Here's a very small sliver of the many fundamental things we don't know about the brain. Number one, how a thought works. Yeah, our biggest, baddest supercomputer is Paul Rudd in Wet Hot American Summer exhausted at the idea of processing even a sliver of the human brain. About seven years ago, give or take, whatever, I had this debilitating, months-long streak of what one of the world's best neurologists thought was migraines, but couldn't be sure. Couldn't be sure? When I asked her what, at least, might be causing these episodes that made it feel like my brain was on an 18th century whaling ship, or how I could possibly relieve them, she, the very best we've got, a wonderfully kind, curious, engaged, an empathetic human being, she shrugged. Why did she shrug? Well, consider this. The number of synapses in one human brain is equal to the number of stars in 5,000 Milky Ways. And then every synapse has something on the order of 100,000 molecular switches in it. And these 100,000 switches, protein molecules in every synapse, communicate a lot with one another. They interact a lot. And then that's in one synapse, and then the human has something between 10 to the 14th and 10 to the 15th synapses. Now, okay, so there's a lot of complexity. And then to make matters worse, it is intricately arranged in very tight quarters. So the synapse, again, there's a billion of them per microliter of brain volume in a human. Remember that each one of those synapses has somewhere between 10 and 100,000 switches in it. So again, we're setting the table stakes here. And yeah, look, AI is here kind of, in some cases, might be jumping past supercomputers. Here's news from this week. Google's DeepMind's AI model named GraphCast was trained on nearly 40 years of historical data and can make a 10-day forecast at six-hour intervals for locations spread around the globe in less than a minute on a computer the size of a small box. Now, it takes a traditional model an hour or more on a supercomputer the size of a school bus to accomplish the same feat. GraphCast was about 10% more accurate than the European model on more than 90% of the weather variables evaluated. And this is maybe where you bitch about your weather app. Vox did a really great investigation, I guess, recently on why all weather apps are basically bad. So definitely check it out. So will we similarly crack the brain like this did? Maybe. The closest comparison in complexity is probably bacteria and more specifically the gut, which you guessed it, we basically don't understand, so maybe specifically isn't the right word here. Sure, we've understood bacteria enough for the last 100 years to discover and save a gazillion lives with antibiotics, but one, we use too many of them, and two, bacteria outdates us by a lot and will outlive us by just as much. Bacteria will be the last thing standing on this desolate rock as the sun goes red giant and then white dwarf, consuming everything up to Mars or so. 
Not that incredible people aren't working to understand the whole microbiome, and even, considering everything above, this seems outlandish, how the brain and gut connect and interact. They're asking questions like, is it a one-way street? A two-way street? Are there intersections or roundabouts? Is there a street at all? And I don't know. Of course, obviously, I am an increasingly ancient liberal arts major who lives to ask questions of people a billion times smarter than I am. Understand, though, that we've come a long way. Even I can grasp that. Do you know how long people used to live? Not very long. Do you know how many kids used to die before they turned five? Most of them. We didn't used to wash our hands. We used to dump poop and dead bodies upstream of our drinking water, or at least somebody else's, and then not wash our hands after we did it. We used to think storms were acts of some sort of angry god. We thought we were the only planet. Then we thought the sun orbited our planet. Then we thought we were the only solar system, the only galaxy, whatever. You get it. We used to dose patients with mercury and opium. Bloodletting was a thing, as was astrology and the humors, which I still haven't figured out what that is. In the year of our Lord, 2023, Kat Bahannon wrote 596 incredible pages describing how the female body actually drove 200 million years of mammalian evolution because we are too sexist to have considered that the biologically childbearing half of our species might be the half that made the species what it is today. We've come a very long way on the brain, too. For example, functional MRIs are super cool. And yet, the more we know, the more we know what we don't know. So here's a question I've seen in a few places that will screw with you. What if the brain can understand itself? Also, what's matter made of? Further, how the hell did we evolve from non-living matter? Did viruses start at the same time? Why does time seem to only go forward? How is consciousness? Why are there two different sandwiches called Sloppy Joes? And of course, one of my all-time favorites, what makes you, you? Enjoy. Good luck sleeping tonight. The point is, here's why I bring all this up today. It's easy to think that unless you are a neuroscientist, a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, a neuropharmacologist, a psychiatrist, someone studying to become one of these, or a gut scientist like my friend Gautam, who's linking up with brain people to ask even bigger, harder, more consequential questions, that you're really not going to contribute to meaningful progress on how we understand the brain. But that would ignore, just to start, how this research is funded. To say that it takes a village would be a monumental understatement, from program officers to grant managers to lab techs and grad students, undergrads and support staff. And this is the way it is for most fields. It's really, really important we figure out as much as we can about the brain and how it interacts with the gut, what causes and treats Alzheimer's or whatever else. Vitally important. It's easy to feel like whatever contribution you can make might not play a significant part in that journey. I have felt that. I get it. And it's wrong. Yes, self-awareness is key, and it's the real reason we all constantly ask the question, how can I help? Why we do what we do here. Not just because we're all shit givers at heart, but because we already know our limitations. And they can make us feel pretty goddamn impotent when the shit hits the fan. If you're someone who's interested and capable of becoming a neuroscientist, a doctor, or elected official, go do it. That's incredible. We will support you. But I'm certainly not one of those people. And that's okay. But it took a while to get there. When my grandparents had dementia, when my cousin and late friend had cancer, when my other cousin and uncle had ALS, when everyone was stuck at home because of COVID and a million other days in my life too, I stewed in my thoughts and emotions, asking over and over, what the fuck can I do about any of this? And the best answer is, of course, what can you do? Because you can always show up. There are always action steps, even for understanding the brain. You can always raise money for care. You can volunteer for a clinical trial. You can almost always give blood. You can always run a race with or host a lemonade stand for a reputable organization who's raising money for pediatric cancer research. You can recruit, campaign for, and get elected candidates who have had brain cancer or abortions or suffered from a lack of health insurance or who were emergency room doctors or all of the above. You can always buy air purifiers for local classrooms, leaning on research that's already been done. 
You can always yell at your city council to subsidize induction stoves for low-income renters, to remove the lead from your pipes, to build bike infrastructure and charge out the ass for parking, and to apply for that fresh federal electric school bus money. If you've got the cash, you can get one of the mill bins and invite your friends over for what they think is a dinner party, but is actually like one of those old-timey Tupperware parties where you mostly extolling the many virtues and co-benefits of reducing food waste. You can get solar and advocate for a local gas ban. You can interrogate your company's mission statement, product lines, and supply chains, even if you're a solopreneur. If you know your way around a hammer, you can help build affordable housing. You can contribute to disaster relief around the world. You can play your flute or oboe or other instrument at a dementia care community. You can bring your golden retriever or rescue whatever dog to say hi to sick kids. There is so much you can do. Everyone plays a part. And look, I too dream of a radically cooler future filled with widely available technologies we can't even begin to dream of. But the most impactful work we can do to get there is often the most pragmatic, attacking today's known weaknesses and opportunities to raise the baseline, to make sure everyone has bootstraps, to make sure scientists and inventors and ethicists on the front lines of the future aren't spending all their time writing grant proposals, to make sure teachers aren't paying for their own classroom supplies. Look, if you don't have a lot to give, but you really want to give, giving a tax-exempt church or progressive Senate candidate in a diehard red state or even a diehard blue state, your hired earned cash is going to go way less far than donating to a local school board race, buying a single bed net, or giving it to a specific teacher through donors choose. It's just math. We can do all these things at once, and none of us has to do it alone. I'm not expecting you to figure out the brain. Don't worry. I'm not going to tell you there are as many of us as there are synapses in the brain. I'm not that bad at math. But as Dr. Tobias Funke once put it, there are dozens of us. Dozens. We can dream of a wildly imaginative future at night and spend our days laying the bricks for a real one that our kids and other people's kids and their kids will actually experience. Wouldn't that be nice to live to see the fruit of our efforts so maybe the youths won't be quite so mad at us? You can always show up, even for brain. You can always take action. You can always use your unknowable brain and perfectly understandable heart to move the needle to do better, better. Here's your action steps. Donate to support the markup's invaluable work examining the ways technology is being used to change society. Number two, volunteer with your local surf rider chapter to keep our waterways, oceans, and beaches clean. Number three, get educated about the easiest ways your company can improve sustainability by reading an article from Protocol we've got linked. Number four, be heard about clean water as a human right by urging your members of Congress to support the Water Act. And last, invest in industries that will measurably move the needle using the IEEFA's financial research. That's it for this week. If you've got feedback, questions, opinions, please send them our way. Email them to questions at importantnotimportant.com. Please hit subscribe to get next week's issue straight to your feed. To go deeper, visit importantnotimportant.com. Thank you for being a part of our community, and thanks for giving a shit.